Gig Gab, episode 365 for Tuesday, November 29th, 2022. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab for everyone who is all ready for the, for for those for whom this is the second or uh, greater episode that you've heard here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. How are things in Napomo, Mr. Kent? Pretty good. Getting you know, not winter like you have winter, but it's definitely colder. So the outdoor gigs are a risk of yeah. being comfortable to play them, and they still happen. Um, because we don't, it won't really rain for a while yet, but it's, you know, colder. And a lot of the venues are trying to squeeze as much time out of outdoors as they can. So yeah, those are, those are really, unco- I mean, you know, you know, probably better than me, but you know, comfortable gigs should be the basic minimum you ask for, but like having <laughs> to fight the elements to get a gig done, I think is, yeah. is tough. And I'd, I'd rather play a gig where it's too hot than a gig where it's too cold. Absolutely. freaking lutely Okay. All right. Well, I know Absolutely. there's some, there, you and I are the same on this. That doesn't surprise me. You and I, we both like to sweat when we play. Absolutely. Yeah. There are people who prefer the cold gigs and I, that, that is not something that computes in my brain and body, but I mean, to each their own, of course, you know, that's fine. Yeah. 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 Well, there are some people who literally, they get a, pre, a heat is oppressive to them, right? They, yeah. They, they, they wilt. Right. Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I don't get it. Yes. Same. <laughs> I mean, you know, direct sunlight can be debilitating, but like a great hot night is like the best thing in the world. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Hey, I, um, I just got an early Christmas present for myself. I wanted to tell you about, so, uh, Tom Petty, who, you know, is part of my Holy Trinity, um, just put out a box set of, he did, he did 20 nights in a row, well, 20 nights in a, in, consecutively, m- maybe not actually in a row, at the Fillmore in San Francisco, famous yeah. au- auditorium. Yeah. And um, he, did, he did a residency, 20, 20 nights there. And now, so that was 97. So okay. now all these years later, yep. yeah, quite a while ago, they put out a box set of these things. And so I bought it. I'm starting to get back into vinyl. So I bought the vinyl of it. And, the, you know, it's really, you know, beautiful package, beautiful artwork. But the thing that I am loving about it, having seen Petty many, 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 many times, they did 20 nights. And evidently, most days at a sound check, they worked up some covers. And there's a ton of fantastic covers on it. And I'm listening to them now, just kind of thinking about what it's like to bring a new song into a band. And these things are, I mean, the ones that made it to this recording are tight as a freaking drum. I mean, they're fantastic. And clearly this band, it it proves a point that I feel that if everybody in the band has the same dictionary of music, it makes learning covers way, way better. Right. So it makes it easier for sure. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it makes it, I, I, I would disagree that it makes it better necessarily, but it certainly makes it easier. Well, I'll tell you, I, I think it makes it better. Usually, for the people who love a certain music and hear the nuances in it, if you if you've been a fan of that type of music and you dig into it, you hear the little things. And if your whole band hears those little things and they kind of organically just happen when you when you pick them up as a cover, they're fantastic. But he does everything from, you know, some Chuck Berry things to, uh, you know, Gloria, you know, by them Van Morrison. Yeah, yeah. And you know, just a a, a great dictionary of covers. That are just it's it is it is a band at the height of their powers is just so fantastic. Huh. So if it and it's it's on streaming, like you can get it all, you can buy it in all different resolutions for for digital. Sure, I bought vinyl, but it actually is on the streaming services. There is some just freaking fantastic things on there. I mean, the opening cut is the Chuck Berry. I guess the Stones did it also around and round. Oh, great song! Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to hear how perfectly tight this thing is right and again if you think about it they just said hey how about this song at at sound check the day of and then it gets on stage and it sounds like that it shows you what's possible when a band is on the same page yep yep 
Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where I say I, I, I don't necessarily agree that it's definitively better is I, certainly I have experienced what you're talking about, where you know somebody brings in a cover and it's just in the band's lexicon, right? Everybody's got that shared history. Everybody knows the song. Everybody knows the nuances, and it just it's easy to make it work, and it just comes right out. But I've also been in scenarios where somebody brings in a cover that in whatever world they come from uh, is is a known thing. But for most of the rest of the people in the band, it's like maybe not even a song they've ever heard before. And and then you get the band's interpretation of it. And that's where it gets, especially like with Tom Petty. I mean, obviously a primarily original band, right? Like they're, they're not a cover band. They're, you know, they, they play Tom Petty and the Heartbreaker songs. And, uh, and so to have some, you know, someone bring something in and then put it through the machine that is whatever that band is that I always, I've always liked that too, is like, okay, like this is how this song makes it through the filters that are, you know, those musicians and that band. And it comes out this way and it's like, Oh yeah. All right, cool. Uh, you know, it, but neither is, neither is better in my mind. It's like, it's cool when I hear somebody just play a straight cover. Like I think I talked about, we went and saw, Oh crap. I can't even remember the name of the band. Old Dominion country act uh, mm -hmm. full of fantastic songwriters who obviously write their own songs, but have written, you know, a, a good segment of the, the modern country music catalog individually. And I, when they came out for their encore, they played a, a Tom Petty tune. They played jam and me. And, mm -hmm. and it was a straight cover. Like there was mm -hmm. nothing different about it. And it was like, wow. Okay. I see where the, like, to your point, I see where this band came from. Like I, these, I, this is their common language. This wasn't one guy that brought in jam and me and said, you guys should listen to this. I think it would sound good. He said, you know, we should play jam and me. And everybody was like, yeah. And then they could just play it. Right. Cause they know it and in their bones, they know it. And that's cool. But I also like covers that come out and they sound radically different because it's like, yep, that's how this band is going to interpret that song. And they're a little more free to do it their own way when you don't have that, 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 you know, baked in history in your bones of a song. So well, I guess it goes one way or the other, right? It's one it way or the other. Like, exactly. Yeah. It's either like is incredibly disappointing to everybody because, you know, nobody's really getting that thing that makes the song that thing yep. and whatever superpower you bring to it may not make it better, right? You try, but you just don't know the song. So you apply what you have to it yep. and you get what you get. But, but, um, or it could be something totally the first time I had never heard Scarlet Begonias before, believe it or not. Sure. That makes sense. That's I a played, Grateful Dead tune I for played, people who don't, who don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And Nick in my band is a big deadhead. Um, you know, he showed me the lick. He showed me the basic feel of it and I played it. And then when I heard it, 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 you know, it sounded totally different, but he goes, no, that's the beauty of the song. The song plays the band, not the band plays the song. Like everybody hears something different in this type of, you know, song huh. and you bring what you have and something cool comes out the other end. And that was, and it was really fun. I mean, I actually got me inspired to learn more dead songs because, you know, it felt it almost is by definition an invitation to do your thing in it. Right. That's that's that jam bandy thing, right? Yeah, and that song in particular, it's a, that's a weird tune. We used to play that in Fling, yeah. and yeah. and I never, I knew of the song, but I never had really listened to the song until we played it. And even then, I, I was more like you. It was like, okay, I understand the form. Okay, there's this, and then we would play it. It's like, okay, I'm not quite. And then I would go listen to like recordings of it. It's like. Oh man, like every recording has a different drum groove. Yeah. Like it's not the same every time. Like which one are we how how do you want to go? Buffett covered it. Did he really? Huh? Yeah. I believe that. Okay, sure. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah, but it is interesting. But, you know, it makes me think. Yeah. It makes me think like covers like I I love live music and I love covers. I love hearing what my favorite artists do with their favorite songs that are covers. Yes. I love hearing my favorite artist songs being covered in interesting ways by other people. I mean, I just, that, that whole thing does it for me when it's a great song, you know, I love to hear what other people hear in it. Like when, when someone covers a Bruce song, 
I'm, I don't want him to sound like Bruce. I mean, I, I've already got that one, right? You know, you know how Bruce did it. Yeah, that's right. I, yep. Exactly. I'm like totally fascinated by what other people do with the music. And even Bruce, who's, who's awesome at taking his own stuff and covering himself and finding different arrangements. You know, he'll do, he'll do Born to Run solo acoustic. He'll do, he'll do, you know, uh, the stuff that he did on like Devils and Dust or Nebraska full band. And it's just a different feel of the same thing. That stuff is mesmerizing to me how someone finds the magic in in a song and and takes it in different places i i I think that's the greatest stuff i i agree it's it's one of the reasons i like playing covers in the original bands that i'm in because it allows us i call the covers that we play the the you know you came up with that term years ago vanity songs right i think our covers in bitter pill and in fling are our most vanity songs because they're the ones where it's like, we're truly just serving ourselves. It's like, we want to play this song. We want to, but, 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 but it also allows the audience a peek at who we are, right? Like you pick this song. Clearly there's a reason for it. Why, you know, that's a really fascinating thing. If somebody wants to get nerdy and go deep, and I, I think it's a it's a cool thing to be able to yeah. to see that, and to be able it's cool to be able to be a part of presenting it. But I, I, I'm the same as you. Like when uh, you know a band that I see, either like I said, you know, like like you said, covers a song by a band I really love, or a band I really love covers a song. It's like oh, interesting. I okay, I see. I, I like that just painted more of the picture here. Okay, there's more to this band than than just what I thought I saw on the surface. And that and that right. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of covers, I just did. Um, well, we we had Davis on last week, which is fantastic. Thank you for all. That of was your unbelievable. Feedback. You know, he has more fans than many of the bands that listen to us. Yeah, I was just thinking, thinking about the people who like were acknowledging his his appearance on the show on our Facebook fan page and our Facebook page. I mean, he clearly has got a following. He's he's well known and extremely well regarded for what he does. Absolutely, yeah. No, he's he, well, he's the real deal too. And I loved, Absolutely. I loved his it, it, the comment that he made several times. I think during the episode while we were recording, and then certainly afterwards, he and I we wound up standing in my driveway in the cold, mind you, for <laughs> probably an hour because the conversation just didn't end. I should have brought microphones out, but um, it, you know his comment. The, the, saying this is a would you like fries with that gig where you know like it is a cust I, I always say every business is the customer service business right if you don't service your customers you won't stay in business very long and he clearly you know believes and takes that to his core and and i can say you know i've experienced it firsthand he's always there he wants it to sound good he has his ways of doing things, but also he's there for the artist to support the artist. Cause he knows Absolutely. the the best per, you know, it, it almost doesn't matter how good the sound is. If the artist isn't comfortable because you're not reproducing the best that the artist can, can deliver. And so he really, he works to make it, to make it work. Yeah. But, but he, um, he, the thing that struck me from the interview. Yeah. We were, remember we asked him, um, I bet you have some, you know, funny stories, you know, of, of, of things that you've seen sure. on stage, right? Yeah. And he talked about some of the festivals that he worked at and he talked about, he didn't, he didn't disparage anybody, but what he did say that just blew me away, delighted me, was he talked about good bands that he worked with and how they, and he used the term, which was really fun, that they leave it all on the stage. And clearly he is a music fan. Clearly. Clearly, there is a deep connection for him when he's working with bands that are going to give it every bit as much as he's giving it. I just love the circle of life that that was. Like, here's a guy who's going to bring his brilliance to help you make sound better. But he is turned on when he sees, you know, he's a fan of music. He's a fan of music. No, he is. And and he's that way. Well, he's certainly been that way with every band that I've worked with him with. Um, You know, he's totally into the show. He really, yeah. Yeah, it's like I, I, I meant what I said. Every band needs a Davis. Um, I, we can't all have a Davis, but um, but you you know find your own version because it's a good thing to have. Yeah, but I did. And, you know, oh, go ahead. In, in our band, Bill is Bill is an equal share in our band. He's a sound guy. Yep. He's he's a band member, right? And we treat him like that. And you know, he doesn't come to every rehearsal, but he also is there. You know, three hours before every gig and 
two hours after every gig. So, you know, I think the time kind of evens out over time, at least evens out, if not more in Bill's favor. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the point of course is there's so much upside to having a guy who's part of your team that takes a lot of pride in, in doing everything except for the music stuff. You know, the guy, cause you know, Bill, Bill does everything. He does sound, he does the advanced work. He'll call the advanced sound companies. He brings, you know, talk about playing in hot weather. He, he brings our beer. He brings us, you know, scented towels, you know, to have on stage while we're playing. That's awesome. I mean, he takes care of everything because he loves it so much. And because he, he's in the band, that's his job is to make it great. And, yeah. and he does it so well, you know, he, yeah, he, he's, he's incredible. And the value, and the funny thing is when, when I, I we, years ago, when I asked the band, you know, we need to make Bill a band member, everyone in the band raised their hand and said, absolutely, absolutely. It wasn't even a discussion. It was, that's it was great. Done. So that, okay. So that, 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 that's interesting. I didn't realize that he wasn't initially just brought in as an equal member. That was a, that was a change that was made at some point early on. It sounds like. Oh, that's good. It was pretty early on. Yeah. yeah. He was learning in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And so he was kind of on the job training. And then, you know, it was actually his, his insistence, you know, dude, I'm, I'm happy to do all this work, but you know, I should, I should be an equal share. Yeah. And so when I took that back to the band again, there was not even a blink. It was like, absolutely. Yep. And you know, for you guys out there who are listening, who know, what it's like to schlep your gear, set your gear, tear your gear down, schlep your gear home. You know, I, I can only imagine that the thought of having a guy do that for you or two people do that for you, you know, is a luxury you might think you can't afford. There are people out there that'll do it. And, yes. you know, if you're cool to them and they they feel like they're a part of the band, they'll become reliable and, you know, it, it, it'll get done for you. It yeah, makes, just just like it makes just like performing all the bore. Just like all the musicians in your band who love what they do and and appreciate being able to apply their craft and all of that. There there are folks like like Bill and and Davis who love to apply their craft too and and find them and work with them. It, it, you know, yeah. it's it's yeah, yeah. It's it's not I mean there's grunt work involved in all of it. Um we all know that. We talk about that here, but but there's also the art of it and, and, you know, doing the sound and, you know, like with Davis doing the videos and even sometime the lights it, you know, there he's, he prides him clearly prides himself on, on that and spends hours perfecting his craft. Um, and I appreciate him coming. It on the gets show to the to point for me it. where we've had guys join the band, you know, anything and Bill's real direct. So he gets his stuff done. Like when, when, when he calls sound check his time, right? Mm. So he'll set the gear and, you know, he's trained us to pay attention and get through our sound checks. And we're now, like, I think I told you a while ago, we, we got on stage, mic ready to go, you know, in ears ready in about 18 minutes for a festival this year. And we kind of set a new standard for ourselves, but we've had guys who, you know, and I'll, I'll tell them, you know, Bill's going to be direct with you. He's only doing it because he wants to get it right for us. And I've had like sensitive guys who, you know, would join the band or, or sub in the band who would, who would take offense to the, the tact and tone and uh, even forewarned. And I'm like, dude, I can get another X, but I cannot get another bill. <laughs> so, right. so you're, yeah. you're going to have to figure this out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sort it out, man. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, and it's about learning how to work together too. It's, you know, it's all of that. Um, yep. Yeah. But anyway, I was saying I, I did that rumors gig. Uh, we did that with uh diaspora radio. We did uh Fleetwood Max rumors. And I talked about the rehearsal process of it here a little bit, but uh, I guess the Thursday before last episode, when we had Davis on, uh, we finally did the gig. And as always happens, we got to the end of the gig and I, I wanted another crack at it. I think we all did, right? Because it's how it goes with those sorts of mm -hmm. things. You know, you play it live the first time and you're like, ah, okay, now I know how I really want to approach this stuff. That sure. said, of of all of the gigs that I've done with Stu, these diaspora radio gigs, which are, he picks an album, we play the album. And depending on the record and Stu's mood, 
we don't necessarily stay stick to the way it was recorded on the record, but this Fleetwood Mac thing was the closest it's ever been. But there were a couple tunes that we, that we changed up a little bit. He came up with this, uh, this Hendrixy gospely thing to do for the, the, well, we, he came up with it for the intro of don't stop, but, uh, but we wound up doing it for most of the song and then just did the last verse and chorus kind of in the, the, you know, straight up shuffle that, that, that everyone knows as that song. And Jennifer Rochelle, who was singing that tune, just crushed it. It really, it was great. But, um, but by and large, we did stick to the, to the record. Uh, I think because, you know, so many of those songs were just so perfectly crafted that, um, that there wasn't, it, it, there wasn't much to improve on, but there was lots to work on. And we wound up having many moments throughout the night with seven parts uh, of vocals. We had people doubling. It was generally three parts that were doubled, uh, sometimes four, depending on, on the tune. But we really spent some time to break it down, learn the harmonies, uh, which for me means learning everyone's harmonies. That's That's the best way for me to know where my part is, is to know where all the parts are, because that way, if I don't get sort of led astray, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, but man, it, like, it went really well. Um, cool. first time out. Yeah, it was fun. It was, um, it was, like I said, I'd love another crack at it both to, you know, sort of polish the rough edges, but also just to have the opportunity to do it again. Cause it was, it was a, it's a tough record there. Those are, those are, you know, there's songs that we all know. And so we think, oh, sure. We'll just be able to knock these out. No, no. These were song. Yeah. These were songs that were, you know, crafted in the studio. And there yeah. were so many nuances. And without those nuances, they don't sound all that good. You know, they. Now, they, Lindsey Buckingham is a really peculiar guitar player. You know, he has a very definitive style. It's yeah. very hard to cop. Is, yeah. is Mick Fleetwood that way? Mick Fleetwood is a. Yeah, he's got his own style. It is a unique style. He he comes from that school, you know, from that old like English blues school, right? Blues, yeah. Yeah, but you don't if you don't know that and you don't dissect the parts, you wouldn't necessarily hear that especially in the stuff that they were doing at the time of rumors with with, you know, Lindsey Buckingham and and Stevie yeah. Nicks. Uh you know, the earlier stuff is is far more uh exemplary of that blues thing but his drumming was still that blues thing and he's got this thing where he really likes to drive with the snare drum and so there's a lot of tunes where he's either playing you know that we, we drummers call it four on the floor where you're hitting you know every quarter note with the bass drum he'll play four on the snare a lot just to drive the tune along and some tunes it'll start with two and four on the snare and by the end of the the tune He's at all four on the snare. He hits the snare a lot on, on the downbeat with a crash, which is usually just kick and cymbal or something, but he'll hit crash and cymbal or a snare and cymbal. And it's, so it's, it's an interesting thing. And then there's tunes where he doesn't play the snare at all. Um, it, you know, like, like gold dust woman is uh, mm -hmm. there's like one snare hit before, I mean, before it gets to like the ride out or whatever, but it's, it's fat. It was fascinating dissecting it. I didn't, cop it exactly i more went for okay what's the feel here for a gig like that i mean we we had three rehearsals but also we only had three rehearsals so i wanted to make sure i was communicating the vibe of it not necessarily exactly what he did and and so just you know trying to trying to cop those feels and knowing where he was like four on the snare made a difference for how I approach the tunes. So yeah, it's, they were, they were a, or there are, I mean, Lindsey Buckingham's not in the band at the moment. Uh, I don't know if he'll ever come back, but, um, mm. but yeah, they are slash were a different band. They're, they're a weird amalgamation of musicians. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They're weird. <laughs> and the yeah, harmonies no, too, just like, it's like so crazy. And like, unnecessarily intricate, I would say, but the result speaks for itself. So maybe. And that stuff just must be what they hear. Right. So they sing, you know, and I think, I don't think it's all again, just feel though. 
You think it, they're produced harmonies? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Sat there and said, "You sing this, you think really?" A hundred percent. Yes. Having dissected it, I am confident that that's what happened. There's no way that those parts just sort of fell together. Somebody sat there at a piano, and, and or whatever instrument, but you know, somebody crafted those harmonies. I mean, they might have like the melody might have just been okay. Yeah, I, you know, I wrote this tune. Here's the melody. Okay, great. What's the chord structure? Okay, great. You know, can we make that a little bit more interesting? Fine. Now that we have all that, let's put some harmonies together. Let's have some fun with it. It was clear that they enjoyed that process of crafting and and piecing together difficult harmonies. Uh, there's no way that stuff was just like, oh, sure. You know, no, 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 no. You start dissecting it. And it's like, okay, this is. This is like somebody sat down and it wouldn't surprise me if they did. Somebody sat down with, you know, a, a, a sheet music and like wrote out the harmonies because because they're they're there are leading tones. There are all sorts of things that just happen in there that don't yeah. that wouldn't just happen. You, you know, they, it would it would be a train wreck if you just said, yeah, OK, sing what you feel. It, it wouldn't if people were being that clever about it. It would, the, 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 I mean, there would be, you know, minor seconds happening all over the place. It wouldn't work. So yeah, mm -hmm. no, I, I, I am of the belief, uh, that, that those were, those were very intentionally crafted harmonies, but it's cool. I mean, it sound amazing. They make it yeah. sound so easy. <laughs> Effortless. Yeah. 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 It's not by the way, I'm at least sure. not for me. There are a couple of. There are at least two Fleetwood Mac tribute bands in my in my in the Bay Area. Really, and um, the thing is, those are interesting because that's not the, it's hard music to get right, and they put a lot of effort into it, but it's not quite right. You know, whether it's the, whether it's a tonality thing or an arrangement thing, you know, on different songs, different things, they they get it mostly right but when you listen it's not like closing your eyes and you think you're here which you know for many people a tribute that is the that is the metric of a tribute band right yeah yeah right right if, if it's a tribute band that's right yeah that, i mean i i for most people that's right yeah did you have a christine mcvee in this group uh we had two female singers uh we had uh, i mentioned jennifer jennifer rochelle we had hadley withington too she did the talking heads gig with us and i've done a bunch of theater stuff with her both at at the seacoast rep theater and also she was at unh as a student when i was doing a bunch of gigs there too um so yeah we i mean we had we had people that could cover every part i, I actually andrew strout the keyboard player and i wound up covering a lot of the christine mcvee stuff uh just because it was sort of in our our respective ranges but um but yeah i mean it, it it you know not not the leads we we let jennifer hadley cover the leads on those mm -hmm. songs obviously but um but in terms of the harmonies yeah that wound up being me a lot and her harmonies are weird that that's probably why i had to learn everything because i wound up with most of the time with the the you know the what i would call the george harrison harmony the one that's like super cool but so hard to find um so yeah, but that it, I, I enjoy that stuff. That's that's always fun. Awesome. Yeah, we did. Um, Good. we did a, a fling gig on Saturday. We did it. It's I think I've talked about it before. There's um these folks here in Durham who have a barn at their at their house. It's a gorgeous setup. Last year we did a gig there where uh, fling played along with the church ladies and Bitter Pill. This year we decided to just do it ourselves because. It, doing the sound ourselves and then doing the sound for two other bands. It, it's tough uh, changing gears from like sound monkey to now I have to be the drummer. Uh, so I've kind of put, I've, I've kind of stopped doing that. Uh, sure. If we're going to, if we're going to have a multi-band bill, I'm I, like, I'm all about multi-band bills. I think it's a great idea. We just have somebody else do the sound all night and then it's, you know, then I can focus on what I need to do, but yeah, changing gears and, being, you know, like Davis said, it, in the would you like fries with that mode to make sure all the other bands are happy. And then it's like, OK, well, now I've got to also take care of me because nobody else is. And, it's, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. So, yeah, we um, we did it just as fling. And I went into it not entirely sure that it was the best idea. It's a weird vibe for the people that generally come and see us. But um but it worked, it, you know, enough people came out. It wound up being a, a nice little gathering. It was, you know, Saturday night of 
Thanksgiving weekend. So it was just sort of laid back and easy. So it was, it was fun. We'll probably wind up doing it again. Mm. Yeah. Good, man. And I did, um, I did a monkey fist thing on, on Sunday. We had Johnny Ozelius playing guitar. We call him Ozzy. Uh, it's it. In fact, the last time we played with Ozzy was I, I want to say like M- March sixth of twenty twenty, and so that was we kind of knew going into that gig or as we were playing that gig that it might be the last one for a while. Um, mm-hmm. And turned out we were more correct than we would have liked to be, but uh, but it was nice to get back together with him and uh, and it was a four to seven gig at the pizza place at Old Rail. And that's a night. I like that time slot on a Sunday afternoon. It's pretty laid back. It's a laid back room. And we were just playing, you know, covers and having fun with it acoustic. And so uh, we got a couple more of those coming up throughout the winter, which I'm looking forward to now, now that we've, now that we've got a lineup. The Sunday gigs I get uh, typically end. I actually have a regular one now, once a month gig at one of the wineries. And so it's one to four. Okay. Yeah, and that actually works pretty well. I mean, yeah. there's funny time slots. So, so my coffee house gig is seven to nine on a Friday night. I usually go to nine thirty. House rocker gigs on a Saturday night would be eight thirty to twelve thirty on, on a club date. Again, in the summer, all bets are off, and you know the the concert series are are you know usually done by nine at the latest. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So easy. So easy. I can't imagine that life of of you know, one thirty, two in the morning. I can't imagine that anymore. When I started the house rockers, one of our first regular gigs was a Wednesday night, nine thirty to one thirty. Oh. And get up in the next morning and go to yeah on a Wednesday night. And we were playing a nobody often on a Wednesday night. Right. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I um, we had a bitter pill gig a couple of weeks ago. We played it at the Shaskeen over in Manchester, and I, you know, I think the night started it. I want to say nine. I think we played from like 1115 to midnight or something like that. And maybe 11 to midnight, but it was weird. I left my house and it was dark. I was like, wow. I like, I haven't done this in years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, yeah. And I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's just cause we're all getting older. Cause that's how linear time works and aging and all that stuff. But absolutely. It seems like the crowds that, want to come to see us are generally happier with the, you know, 10 PM end time as opposed to the midnight or 1 PM end times. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. But that, I, well, I told you that one place that we played Charlie's. Yeah. 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 Live band early. And then, and then when we're done, the DJ hits it and the crowd basically turns over. Right. And uh, I think that's a, that's, if I had a club, I would do that. That's, that's a pretty good formula. That Yeah. I guess that works. Yeah. Just being, being aware of, of you know, what type of crowd the band's going to draw versus what type of crowd is, is going to want to be there for a DJ. And if you can, if you can yeah. get two, two different crowds, um, in one night, you probably mm-hmm. make, I don't know, maybe not double your money, but probably 50% more of your money being smart like that. So, yeah. well, I mean, you know, you've already turned on the lights and opened the doors. That's probably gravy at that point. Cause you're probably going to be open regardless and if the band's going to peter out or the band's crowd is going to peter out toward the end don't have the band there just turn it over For yeah sure. yeah interesting what do you got any uh do you have any holiday like themed gigs coming up this month i know we talked about that and said there wasn't a lot of interest yeah i don't, I don't have any corporate parties for the house rockers this year first yeah. time we haven't had any but i also don't know anybody who has like a, a good corporate party and fewer New Year's Eve events. There's some, but way fewer, it seems. Um, I, I, I started doing this thing where I go to a retirement home and I'll, and I'll play a set just because it's a nice thing to do. And I just played one yesterday, which was kind of nice, and threw in some holiday songs and uh, solo acoustic. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, for the rest of my solo gigs, I, I actually – I. I don't have any other, I don't have any combo or band gigs. So everything I have in December is going to be solo stuff. So I will definitely throw in, you know, just stuff that sounds okay. Solo it was a cool right. Willie Nelson Christmas album that, that I can cop a bunch of songs and that'll translate well solo. 
Huh. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, you. that makes sense. I have, let's see, I have a fling acoustic gig on Saturday in downtown Durham, which is the town I live in. Uh, there's a, a an event that happens every year called Frost Fest. We aren't playing at Frost Fest because that would be outside and that's not really what we just talked about, right? Uh, but we are playing indoors at this uh, venue called the Freedom Cafe and uh, – and so that's going to happen sort of at the same time as this frost fest, which is, which just has people downtown sort of moving from, from spot to spot. So it should be a pretty cool little, little, you know, little vibe. We'll play one probably hour, maybe hour and 15 minute acoustic set. Are you learning Christmas songs for it? No, we haven't learned any Christmas songs for it. And I don't believe we're going to. So I, th- I think it's going to, I mean, you never know what would happen at the, the, you know, at the last minute, but I doubt it. Um, we did add run Rudolph run, uh, to yeah. the monkey fist list on, on Sunday. That was fun. That was, that was a good one to throw in, you know, there's a, um, another good one is George Thurgood has a rock and roll Christmas oh. just straight ahead. Yeah. I think I've heard that. Yeah. 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 That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. We did our, our, I had our last house rocker gig was the middle of November. And since it was going to be our last house rocker gig, we did throw in Santa Claus is coming to town. Oh, nice. It was actually kind of nice. It was before Thanksgiving. So a couple of people raised a few eyebrows, but yeah, you know, what the hell? Yeah. With that. Yeah. Why not? It's fine. It's, it's fine. It's going to be okay. It's one song. <laughs> That's right. Moving on. That's it's one right. Song. It's one yeah. song. <laughs> hey, early on in the house rockers, we did a, we did a Christmas show. We rented a theater. I remember my yeah. first experience doing four wall stuff and it was fun. It was a family thing. And you know, it, that, that was a really good experience. I would do that. I would, I would do that again if I could find the right venue to partner with for something like that you know a place where kids could come so you, you know that would rule out most nightclubs i don't, right. even, I don't even know the what the rules are if you're it, can you ha- can you be a nightclub but not serve alcohol and allow kids in or as soon as you have a liquor license you automatically can't have kids in i think it depends on your state um i know here in new hampshire if you want to have a liquor license generally speaking, you also need to serve food. Um, mm. I, but like, I don't think that's the case over the border in Maine, for example. Um, mm. it, but, but yeah, every state has different, you know, parameters and, and guidelines like here in New Hampshire, I'm pretty sure even if a gig is 21 and over, if the, if a person under 21 is there with their parent or guardian, they can come in. Like generally yeah. speaking, but that's not the case everywhere. So it's, yeah, it's no. different. It, you know, you'd have to check your, yeah, that that, the, the people with the liquor licenses would know, should know. I, I was going to say would know they might not, you know, <laughs> but, yeah. but they, yeah, they, they probably learn pretty quickly if they don't. Yeah. Yeah. And we did it in a theater, um, a small theater, you know, like yep. a 220 person theater that was used for a melodrama or something like that but it was cool it had a balcony and we set up a snow machine and you know we oh. kind of did the whole thing and re- people really really liked it and it was a good experience to learn about four walling things it was you know again if i had the energy i had then that's what i would probably do with a cover band is mm-hmm. like pick guys who are really committed to learning a ton of material you should have a Valentine's show. You can, you, you know, if you develop a good, if you're a good band, develop a good, you know, following, you can sell these people tickets several times a year. And if you have different shows to do at different times, you know, I, I want to do a summer kickoff show. So a bunch of Jimmy Buffett and, you know, just kind of fun summer music. I think that in, in a world where there are less, at least the worlds that I inhabit out here, less clubs, more wineries and a lot of wineries looking for something to do with their wine club members or have big properties. And, you know, th- those partnerships that we talk about are kind of there for the asking. Yeah. That's what I would do. I would have a Christmas show and I would have a Valentine's day show and I would have a summer kickoff show. We already do a Halloween show. I would do a, uh, an album cover, you know, like, you know, some bands do that. Some yeah. bands do that on Halloween. Yeah, right, right. right. Fish does that, right? 
Uh, they 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 used to. Now they basically write a new record and pretend it's somebody else's. But they, it's new. It's they play a record of original stuff. It's generally what they do. But yes, it like they certainly did that for a long time, where they would pick a, a, a someone else's album and and that was their musical costume for the you know for the year. Yeah. Yeah. So the vibe when the this Halloween show that we done turned into a thing, right? So two years now, sold out. Still don't think we've hit the top limit of what we could charge for tickets. We're close, but sure. But um, you know, some some people grumbled when we raised the price, but but we still sold it out. And the thing is, it's a good time. It's a it's a grown ups who want to have a nice night out, especially those who are now empty nesters again, right? That now are going back out into the world. They don't really want to go to a bar, but they sure like a nice winery, and they like you know a comfortable you know environment. You know they'll they'll pay tickets for the convenience oh, and, yeah. and comfort of seeing something in a really nice place. Yeah, that's a that's a a, um, a you know a high uh, disposable income crowd is what that becomes. Generally speaking, right where you the empty nester crowd, it, it yeah those people that want to leave their house but want to be comfortable when doing it, they're willing to pay for that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I would I would I would four wall four different four or five different shows and always try and delight people and surprise people, you know, with these things. And, you know, I, I do events. And so, you know, th some of the touches are natural to me, but there's a million event managers out there that you could get to partner with you on these things or hire them straight out. Yep. You do the math if you could afford it out of the ticket price, but this, this basic premise. Or, or, of, or, or let them do the math as part of their interview process. Like how would you yeah, make yeah. this work? Run the business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're going to run the business, Make sure you get paid too, you know, like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But the, the basic deal that, you know, I've got a fan base, you've got a wine club membership or a distillery membership, you know, people who, who look at hanging out at your place as kind of their country club. Um, so let's, let's put these audiences together. We'll do all the work, play all the music. You can keep all the booze, but we can keep all the tickets. Yep. It's not. Not a bad thing. No, there's, there's, there's money to be made. That's a, that's a, you know, what I always, I always say, I look for non zero sum games, right. Where, you know, it, it, you, everyone can win. It doesn't in order a zero sum game means that in order for one person to win, the other person has to lose. Right. But right. what you're describing is a non zero sum game. It's everybody gets yeah. to, everybody gets to win. And, and the crowd, the people that are showing up, bringing the money, the customers are happy. It, you know, it's, yeah. they're doing what they want to do. So that's really Someone once said to me, what, you know, wait, you're bringing your fans. You should get a piece of their bar. You know, that they, they would pay that. They're still making money. And I was like, you know what? There's no need, you know, to really push every advantage of these types of things. And right. The relationship is the relationship and hassle free relationship without it being contentious where someone feels like, you know, they're being forced to give more than they really would like to give. That's, that's not win-win. No, it's not win-win. Yeah, even if even if financially you can, you know, break it down and say actually it's more fair this way. If not everybody feels like it's fair, then yeah. it, like you said, there's 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 friction there and they're going to be looking for someone else to partner with. You've given them this idea, you've proven it out, right? Proof of concept has happened. But yeah, we don't like working with those people because they keep sticking their hands in our pockets. Let's go to somebody yeah. else who doesn't want to do that and and you know, you're out. So there's two clubs in the area that um, that do a door split, right? Yep. Um, one is really nice. One is le less nice by a degree. Sure. The really nice one is 80-20. The less nice one is 60-40. And when I brought up this fact to the guy who was 60-40, his justification for the 60-40 was uh, he didn't even believe what he was saying, you know, like my club's nicer or something like that. But at the end <laughs> of the day... It was like, if you don't take it, someone else will. <laughs> somebody, somebody else will. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah, that's generally how that works. Yeah. Door, door splits. As long as everything is spelled out clearly, it can, I mean, it's fine. If you know what you're getting into and you agree to it and it, and you like the deal, take the deal, but just make sure you know the deal. And we talked about that, that club I experienced recently yeah. where like they didn't tell you the deal. Like, okay, well that, that's a, like, that's a huge red flag right there. If they're not telling you the deal up front, they, they, they're acting like Good they change. have something to <laughs> yeah. side, something to yeah. hide. What is it? You know, well, what's next is really my question in those scenarios. It's like, okay, we dug and we found out this much. 
what are what have we missed? Like, what don't we know? Uh, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'll move on. I'll go somewhere else. Yeah. So there's a club down here where I live now where it is it's small. Yeah. The owner is really charming, just a really nice guy. And he's effusive about the musicians. But the deal there is he'll pay you based upon how he does that night. Right. So, so it's a split, I, but, but a non-specific not a split. split. Not okay. a split. No, it has nothing to do with it. There's no cover at the door. So, Got it. so he does their food. Right. But which usually I would not do that, but this guy is so good at making you feel loved. And every good musician in this area plays the club, uh, you know, several times a year. And, um, but it's just interesting. He basically, he's doing what you said you should never sign up for, uh, you know, because you don't know what you don't goes know. in. And, yeah. Yeah. And I've had nights where I, where I've, you know, been like, Hmm, really pretty many people in here. And I've had nights where like, Oh, that's a nice surprise. So, so I don't know what goes into his thing, but it, it's just that he's created the vibe where you don't ask. And <laughs> I mean, I'm sure someone asks, but yeah, you know, but, but everyone it works I've out. To plays there, yeah. Everyone I talk to play, they just go, oh, that's Charlie. You know, he's a great guy. People love him. You do it every one, a couple times a year, just because it's, a, you know, it's a good place to say you play, but <clears throat> there's, there's a, a, a magical mystery tour of, of payment process. <laughs> but it sounds like he's not taking every advantage to screw the musicians. Cause if he was word would get around and, and, and the vibe would not be what you just described, right? Like this is, he's almost the exception that proves the rule. Right. Cause he's, it sounds yeah. like he's mostly doing some, something that falls into the realm of the right thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd give that. Yeah. 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 It's cool. Is your, I, I have a question for you. Um, cause we, we got a recommendation for a piece of gear from, uh, from Adam who is in the van band there. Uh, is your whole band on in-ears yet or no? Um, the new, new drummer goes back and forth. He has them sure. so far. He's, he's preferred using a wedge. Got it. Cause Adam uh, described a thing for us, uh, where he, his whole band is on in-ears and he is, he uses his vocal mic to communicate with the band just in their ears. And the way he does it is with this, uh, it's a, a box called the Hotshot DM1. It's a, a microphone. They call it a signal muting fo foot switch, but really it's from Radial Engineering. We'll put a link in the show notes at Gig Gab Podcast, but it's the Hotshot DM1. And what it does is it's, it's, it is a switch with, with, uh, with one button and, and then a, 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 you can configure what happens when you press that button. It's got one input and two XLR outputs. So he plugs his mic into the one input and then both XLR outputs go to the board and he's got one, the, the output one goes to, you know, his main vocal channel that would be, you know, out to the house and in the monitors, like the normal thing. And then output two goes into a separate channel on the board that only is fed to people's ears. And so when he, uh, just presses down on the toggle, the sound only goes to people's ears. And so he can give cues in between songs or as a song is ending, he can give a cue for what the next song is going to mm. be, or even a count off or whatever. And then he just lets go of the toggle and boom, he's back to live. Back in the house. Yeah. 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 And I, and so I, I wanted to share that. I think it's about 150 bucks. Um, but uh, I'm looking at it right now. It's exactly 150 bucks. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, but a great idea. And you can have it either go to the second output when you hit the toggle button, or you can have it lift the signal, essentially making it like a cough switch, like maybe a podcaster would want to use. Right. You know, where, uh, but I, I don't know. I, I, I don't have one of these, so I don't want to say that it would be good for podcasting. The trick with podcasting for a cough switch is you need that switch to not make noise, like an, an audible noise. And I can't tell whether this makes like a click when he, when it's pushed down or not, but, um, but yeah, yep. a, like a great idea for bands that have, uh, that everybody's on ears. I suppose though, it doesn't have to be a band that's all on ears. You could just feed it to monitor wedges. And if you've got the wedges in the right spots, you know, people can hear it without, uh, it being broadcast to the main. So I suppose it could work, especially if it's your drummer back there with a wedge. I mean, that, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, that, that would work fine. Um, 
if, if you find I, if if in in your specific band you find that this would be a helpful thing. I, I was really curious when he told me what he was doing. I'm like, wait, what gear are you using to do that? And he's like, aha, the hotshot DM one. Like, great. Perfect. I don't know about you. I, I would love to have Adam on the show. We got the suggestion Same. that we should have Adam on the show. Yeah. So Adam, I know you're listening to this out there. So expect, expect us to reach out and to grab you and to, and to have you, you know, do a chat with us. It is funny to me. He is so on top of everything. Yep. Like, like he sent us this nice note. And we, you know, we reply and he's sent us several notes over the years. And then he reveals even more of how on top of it is and how prepared he is and how he considers every eventuality. I mean, it exhausts me, but he clearly loves the process of running the band yes. as a business. And that's what you do if it's your business. You make sure it's as fail safe as possible, right? So he has... He has his process for getting subs, you know, integrated. He has his process for, you know, doing sound on stage. I mean, everything he's, he's, he's kind of like the model citizen for, you know, how to really, really take care of everything and run a band that's going to continue working regardless of what life throws at you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he is. He, yep. I, I think that's a, that's a fair way to say it. Yeah. That would be great to get Adam on the show. I think that All right, we have Adam, a, we're coming for you. a lot to learn from you, Adam. That's right. Yep. <laughs> so thank you for that, Adam. A great Great little piece of gear that uh, that could that could really help, you know, depending on how your band runs. So uh, I see I've seen musicians do it where they have two microphones set up, you know, one, uh -huh. uh, you know, just for the. But I can imagine you you would need a foot switch scenario with that, too. Otherwise, that mic is just going to bleed into people's ears like crazy all night. And right. most people are going to turn it down and that's the last thing you want. Right. So yeah. I would imagine you're using this foot switch either way, but this way you can just do it into your main mic. And as long as you're not having like long conversations that look weird to the crowd that they can't hear, then yeah. it's probably going to be fine. Yeah. I'm thinking as, you, as you're saying this and I'm thinking about Adam and the nice note that he sent us, I was thinking about what it was like when, when everybody started doing streaming shows during the pandemic. Yeah. And the, the amount of tech to master really made it hard to relax and perform well. I mean, you're literally thinking, you know, is the sound right? Is, you know, oh, is yeah. everything happening the way I think it's happening? And, you know, and it's really hard to self-tech. I mean, you do a lot of it, right? Yeah, well, you I'm doing it right. I'm, I was thinking great. as you were describing that, I'm like, well, that's, that's what I do when we record the show. Because we record this show live. The mix that I make live, I have a, a mixer in front of me, sort of, uh, and I'm running faders while we do the show and whatever I come up with, that's it. Like that's, you know, that I have no uh, stem tracks to go back to. I probably should, but I've been doing it 17 and a half years. And so I, I you know, like you I trust just myself. Got it down. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, but there's times where it like, it, and I'm sure you can attest to this, Paul. There's times when, you know, we get five, 10 minutes in, it's like, uh, Shoot, man, we got to stop. We got to go back. To not the that many times, but not, not that, that many, many times, times. But it's happened, yeah. right? You know, yeah, so. yeah. But you know, that's what I was thinking. Is like, I I like to just emote when I play, right? Sure. If I had to think about press this button so I can tell the drummer not to, you know, not to do this cue or or remind the sub that this is coming up or that that doesn't sound like fun to me. But it it is what you have to do if you're getting paid, and you know your regular saxophone player couldn't make the gig. You know, That's right. right. Yeah. You know, it, well, and it what is, you do have to do is what pros do. It is fun to some of us. Like I, I enjoy it to, to a certain degree. And then beyond that, I don't enjoy it anymore, but to a certain degree, I enjoy that sort of without a net thing where you, you kind of have to fly some part of it by the seat of your pants. Like there's, that's exciting to me. It keeps me engaged in the gig. I don't like to be bored, right? I, I like to have a challenge. And so some level of that challenge is interesting. Again, uh, there's, there's a moment at which it goes beyond that level and then it sucks. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, for me, it would be more like if you were to look in my brain during a gig, it would be calculating how the written set is going versus what I'm feeling in the room. Yep. What, what should I, what song should I pull back a little bit of, you know, Oh, you know, I promised so-and-so he'd sing two tonight instead of four, instead of one or whatever, yep. a little bit of, 
you know, I've said the same thing between song A and B for the last six shows. I really want to surprise the band and, you know, really connect with the audience in a different way. So if you were to, if you were to look at my brain, those are the types of things that would be yeah. going on. So you, all very performance related. Yeah, you've got the, but I that's your to, own version of without a tech on top of that. Yeah. Well, but if I had to add the tech on top of that, I would, I would be useless. I would be hapless. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. Without hap- yeah, it's, it's how, right. It's, it's how our brains are wired. Like what, what does it yeah. take to... I, you know, I, it, it was funny, actually, when we were in the green room before we did that rumors show, we were talking about, you know, some of the transitions and stuff. And and so much of that stuff is, you know, we talk it through and it sounds fine. But as soon as there's one little distraction, it's easy for one or more of the seven people on stage to forget that little nuance that we talked about in the green yeah. room that everybody was like, yes, that's great. If it's not right in front of you or burned into your brain somebody's going to miss it. It's how it goes. Right. And, and Stu had a great way of saying it. Cause it was like, I'm like, well, make sure you write that down. He's like, nah, I don't even want to write it down. He's like, I just want to find a way to commit it to my lizard brain. He's like, cause when I'm on <laughs> stage, man, it's all just lizard brain. He's like, if I have to read yeah. something, I like, I'm going to miss it. And it's like, well, yeah, that's true of all of us for sure. And so, you know, it happens and it's fine. And, and the nice part about playing with Stu is he, he understands that and forgives it. But also if it's something that someone has missed that he's aware of, he will very kindly communicate to the musicians like, okay, it's, it, we're here now. That's fine. This isn't exactly what we planned, but it's cool. We're going to go there now. And, you know, and it's, it's great. He's a, in, in that sense, he's a, he's a good band leader. He's a, different kind of band leader than I've, I've worked with before. I mean, everybody's got their own little, you know, their, their own little nuances, but, but yeah, that yeah. comment about, you know, commit it to your lizard brain. That's valuable stuff right there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And we have all have different capabilities. The lizard brain works a little differently in most people. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, for sure. Yep. Last gig that we did, we had, um, I think, I, I don't remember if I shared about this, but we've been the last four or five gigs I've been just giving the guys, since we're not rehearsing, I've just been giving the guys songs right. that are in the House Rockers back catalog. So the new guys have to learn them uh, and say, just come, we're, we're going to run them at soundcheck. And we're often doing soundcheck live. I mean, there's like in a, the bar that there's we've been playing there. It, sure. Yeah. There's people, right? Yeah. Not that many, but there are people there. Right. So, so I've found that whole thing really fascinating because, um, the first time was a little rougher than it should have been. Even though I forewarned the bar will be open. There will be p- people listening to our, so, you know, come ready to go. Right. Right. But after the first time, the guys have really upped it. But the last one that we did, um, so we've added, you know, nine to nine to 10 songs over the last several gigs. The last one, we tried to bring back a uh, new sensation by in excess. Cool song, right? You t- Yeah. You mentioned that. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Did, how did it go? Well, it's it's just a very weird roadmap. Yes. It's you 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 either have to memorize it or you have to give yourself whatever the cue is for what breaks from a from an A to a B part. Uh it's just it's just not it's just not a natural yep. you know, roadmap. Um and uh we it didn't go well. I mean, I mean it, actually when it, when everybody was in the groove, you could see it's going to go well, but just the roadmap you know, we kept barfing on. And um, so there were probably 20, 30 people in the bar and we'd stop, talk about what just happened, <laughs> you know, back, back try to the again, top. Yep. <laughs> try it again. Yeah. And uh, you know, the horns are on charts. So they're the, they're the source of truth, right? Sure. So that, yep. That's absolutely the way it should be. So they, that wasn't the problem, but the rhythm section was, you know, it's just, an, it's just an odd song. It's a, it's a hard to, but I will take that experience experience for my for my band um i bet i bet a it'll make everybody learn the song for next time no questions and you know how it is with you know you go learn you're like i know it well enough and i'll i'll pick up the the cue i need from the guy next to me is is not an uncommon thing right you right know, this is as good as every amount of time i'm willing to put into this or able to put into this Here's who I am, but at least I have a plan to cover myself to get me over the finish line. Is not an uncommon way that musicians prepare for these things. I believe. You, uh, no, you that, agree with that. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. They, I've I've definitely been guilty of that. It it's not yeah. it's not the best way, but sometimes it no, no, is no. the way. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So I, I would take actually the, the discomfort I felt on stage for us not being able to get through this. And I actually am one, one of the people, you know, like, like I, I it, all, all the rhythm section was pretty equal in their, in their questions, but we mapped the harmony out and we nailed the harmony right away, right in front of people. So that was kind of cool. And, um, and it was just a roadmap thing. And I would actually take the failure in, it, it'll serve us well in the long term to get us through more stuff. So I always that's, find, that's, and, and actually, I, I hope that it becomes a thing where people who want to see us mm. can kind of get a little, you know, hint behind the curtain if they come early to gigs now. And so maybe that'll be kind of fun for people as well. I like that idea. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah, I always find just the way I learn, the way the way I commit stuff to my lizard brain is, I like to. You know, I, I do whatever prep I think I need to do. And then I play, once I play the song through once with a band, that's when I know what I need to learn, right? That's mm. the, the moment that teaches me because I'm either playing it along. I'm usually playing it along with the record, right? So there's all kinds of sonic cues happening that, you know, just aren't going to be there necessarily when I go and play it. And, and I need to learn what's missing so that yeah. I can cover okay, there's not going to be that, that, that little scratchy guitar that they put in at the last second in the studio, but somehow is cueing me that that's where the chorus comes in. Like, I don't actually know where the chorus comes in, but I'm cued by that thing. That thing doesn't yep. exist anymore. So I, lost. <laughs> yeah, I'm so now I'm lost. Right. But now I know that that's where I get lost. And it's like, ah, okay. Now I yep. know what to do for the next time. And so, yeah, it's, but that's just how, I mean, that's the process, right? That's yeah. why I want to do the rumors gig again. Cause it like, that's how it went. Get it right. I want to yeah. get it right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. We've been at this over an hour, my friend. And you, I would have guessed I would have been a short one. I would have guessed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you caught your second wind on this one for sure. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good. All right. And I caught mine too. This is a little later. We are recording a little later at, at night and I, I definitely, I, you know, we're, it's like 11, 1120 for me right now. And I, I definitely do better from 10 PM onward that that whole musicians hours. Yeah. That whole, like from about 6 PM to nine thirty PM is, is tough for me. And then, and then I, I, I find my second win too. So yeah, this is good. All right, folks, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We would love to hear from you. Send in your questions. Send in your thoughts. Tell us we're wrong. Tell us we're right if you really want to. Send in your cool stuff, like Adam's, that hotshot DM1. We want to know more about stuff like that. Send it in. We'll share it on the show. Hey, Paul, what do we say? Always be performing. That's it. 